part one. I'm going to talk about the situation with property here in the city. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. I understand that you all own your own home, and some of you may be interested in buying additional property here in the city. So I hope you will find the information I am going to share with you useful and informative. I'm going to talk about the situation with property here in the city. The city centre of any area is obviously going to have the highest prices, and as more and more people are competing for houses in this area. Both renting and buying are becoming increasingly difficult. It is most people's dream to one day own their own house. House ownership gives us a feeling of having achieved something, and we can see clearly what we have worked so hard for all our lives. It can give us a sense of security for our old age and a knowledge that we will hopefully have something to pass on to our children. However, buying a house, particularly for first-time buyers, Is becoming more and more difficult, not only due to increasing prices, but also because of the need for a substantial deposit. For younger people, buying their first home is very difficult and often impossible. Young couples who cannot get the deposit together need to rent for a long time and sometimes forever. While traditionally homes near the centre of the city have been the most desirable, people are now looking further afield. This has happened for a number of reasons. The main one being that our style of work is changing, along with that of other countries such as the USA. In certain professions, for example, sales and computing, it is no longer necessary for people to be based in an office full time. More and more people are beginning to work from home, which means they can avoid the hustle and bustle of rush hour traffic jams into work and have more freedom to choose to live in a more rural and peaceful location. My company deals with finding property for both purchasers and renters in the city area. One of my main roles within the company is to find investment properties for people who wish to plan ahead for their future. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. An investment property is usually at the cheaper end of the market. People buy investment properties not to live in, but in addition to their own home in order to rent it out to other people. The advantage of putting your savings into property for the future is that you can be pretty certain that, as a long-term investment, your money will safely increase in value in line with inflation. Many people are turning to property investment instead of pension schemes, as we hear the horror stories of countries such as the UK, where people have invested all their lives into their pension schemes to find that now their money is relatively worthless. Houses automatically earn what is known as capital gains. That is, for every year you own the property, it becomes more valuable and often gives a better rate of interest on your money than most banks do. However, that is not to say there are no risks. There are people who buy property when the market is high and prices are inflated beyond their true value, only to find that when the housing market slows down, they are in a state of negative equity. Negative equity is a situation that arises when you owe more for the house than the house itself is worth. In short, the best advice is to be aware of the ups and downs of the housing market. Property investment, if handled correctly, can be enormously satisfying. I hope that this has given you an insight into the basics of the property market. Thank you for listening. Please raise your hand if you have any questions, and I will try to be of assistance. That is the end of part one.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a new student, Stefan, talking to an assistant, Anna, at the student union about his membership. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hi, can I help you? Um, yeah, I hope so. Um, this is the first time I've been down to the Union. I'm a new international student and I just wondered what to do. Oh, right. Well, normally we ask international students to fill out this form and we put your details on the wall by reception. Then other students can contact you. It's a way for everybody to get to know each other. It can be a bit lonely otherwise. <laughs> oh, I see. What's your name? I'm Anna, by the way. It's Stefan Unger. OK, well, just write that there next to name uh -huh. and then fill in the rest. All right. Um. What does it mean, degree programme? Oh, uh, just if you are an undergraduate or a postgraduate. Or maybe you're just here for a short course? I'm a postgraduate. Oh. Uh, do I need to say what in? Not really. It's too much detail. But you should put your department so people who have the same interests or problems as you can get in touch. So I'm studying marine construction, so... For department, do I put down the science faculty then? Uh, just your actual department. That must be engineering, no? Oh, I see, yes. Then if you list what you like doing in your free time, not that we ever get any when we're studying, <laughs> and maybe you can meet up with someone socially or to join a club or something. Well, I like lots of things. Shall I just list them? Um, my advice is to just put one or two, like football and films or whatever. Otherwise, you'll get so many invitations, you won't get any time to work. OK. I think I'll just list computer games, as that's my big interest. Oh. I haven't played football for ages. <laughs> I may start to play once I get settled. Now, let's see. Next thing is languages. Yes. We find many of the international students get a bit tired of speaking English all the time. Sometimes they like to speak to someone in their own language. It's up to you. That is a good idea. I presume I don't need to put English down. Oh, no. <laughs> I put um, Italian and French. <laughs> I can only speak German, my mother tongue. OK, well, that's fine. Just put that. Uh... What does accommodation mean? Is that my address? We're trying to find similarities between people and some people live in hall, some are in flats, some are in bedsits. So it helps if you say. I'm in hall, though I'd like to be in a flat, but that won't happen till the end of the first term. Put where you are now. You can always change it later. Uh, then finally, just put your phone number. I haven't really got one. I haven't sorted out a mobile yet. Well, it's going to be difficult for people to contact you then, isn't it? Mm. Why don't you put the union one and we'll take messages for you? 
Okay. It's o two nine five o six five nine double o three. Have you got that? Uh, yes. Okay then. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. Oh, I had a couple more questions about the services you've got here. Um, it says there's a photocopier here. Yes, you need to get a card from the shop, and then it's available to all students in the mornings. The union uses it after one p.m. Okay. I see. Also, the union organizes loads of events. Are they always held here in the union building? It looks big enough. <laughs> If you're interested in something, you should check the poster or our website. In fact, we normally use the round theatre opposite the conference centre for most events because the sound system is better. Right. I'll do that. Also, I wanted to hire a van. Can I do that through you? Um, no. You need to present a case, really.、Oh. They're not just available for hire to anyone.、Mm. The president said we have to limit who is allowed to hire them. The person you need to see is the transport secretary. She's on the second floor. Okay, thanks. The other thing is. Are all the discounts we get with our union card listed on the back of the card? I thought there might be more. No, that's it. I'm afraid, mainly books, clothes, and music. Though we are currently negotiating to get one on newspapers, so that should be valid from next term. Okay, thanks a lot for your help. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a lecture on fishing. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. And in case you've forgotten, my name is Dr. North from the Marine Habitat Research Unit at the University, and I'm going to continue from the lecture that I gave a fortnight ago on humankind's relationship with the sea from a historical point of view, and also on. Attitudes to different types of fishing. In today's talk, I would like to focus on the current problems in the fishing industry in Europe, and in particular, the present scarcity of marine fish. As with the last lecture, I've placed a book list, a few relevant articles, and a copy of this lecture on the department website. A statistic to begin with: since the 1970s. Stocks of the most heavily fished species have fallen on average by ninety percent. And why has this happened? Well, 
There's a chain of events which begins with the demographic changes that have taken place in the world over the last century. During this time, the world population has grown at a phenomenal rate, with efficient and heavy fishing, which is technology driven, meeting the increasing demands for food. As a consequence, many fishing stocks in the European waters, from the Atlantic to the North Sea and the Mediterranean, are now on the verge of collapse. But the problem is not restricted to European waters. It's a situation that's all too clear all around the world. Fish stocks in the Pacific Ocean, for example, are now on the verge of collapse due to a combination of overfishing and natural changes in ocean ecology. And there's another reason behind the increased demand for fish, and that is the changes in the eating patterns of different countries. Certain countries have a long tradition of fishing, for example, the southern European countries, but eating patterns have changed in countries like the United Kingdom, where fish was once considered as food for the poor rather than the rich. People have been turning to fish as a cheap and healthy alternative to meat, driving up demand and depleting stocks. Food scares like BSE and foot and mouth disease have also driven people away from eating meat, which again is invariably replaced by fish. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Another important reason is that a sizable proportion of the catch from modern trawlers or fishing boats is thrown away. Nets quite often land fish that are not wanted and which are thrown back into the sea dead. Discarded nets and other traps are responsible for the deaths of many fish. Our seas like the rest of our environment, are littered with rubbish, which also destroys lots of fish. And fish are also being changed by the chemicals dumped into the oceans, as well as by overfishing, so the size of certain species is decreasing. More then have to be fished to produce a decent catch. And the solution? Well, there has to be more than one answer to the problem. Fish farms provide a partial solution, but the quality of the fish is usually inferior to those in the wild. Reducing the amount of fish that any one trawler or fishing boat is allowed to land is the most effective, but also the most unpopular measure. Countries in Europe like Spain rely heavily on fishing, and are naturally against any step which restricts their catch. But if the depletion of fishing stocks continues, there will be no fish left to fish. Take the disappearance of cod from the Great Banks off Newfoundland, which was once the richest cod fishing area in the Atlantic. After a dramatic fall in the cod population for some unknown reason, a ban was imposed, which, it was hoped, would lead to a repopulation of the cod stocks. The cod did not return, and many fishermen were put out of work. This is a scenario which we do not want to be repeated on a large scale. Now, if you look at this table on the screen, you can see where I... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. 
you'll hear a man giving a lecture on nuclear fusion. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I'd like to start by thanking so many of you for attending this, my first public lecture at this magnificent university. I'm going to be talking to you today about nuclear fusion. Before I proceed further, I would like to apologize on behalf of some of our newspapers for the sensationalist and hopelessly inaccurate articles that have been published on the subject over the years. I must confess that my own interest in the subject was actually stimulated by an article published more than 50 years ago in a popular Sunday tabloid with the impressive title, Power from the Sea. Today, most people would probably interpret such a title as an introduction to a discussion on the latest developments in renewable energy sources, such as wave technology or generating electricity from tidal flows. But back then, little, if any, progress had been made in these fields since the invention of the water wheel. As I recall, following coverage of the opening of the world's first commercial nuclear power station more than 50 years ago now at Calder Hall in 1956, the article promised that we would have limitless, almost free electricity within 10 years. It claimed that we could do this using an isotope of water, deuterium, from the sea. This would be used in reactors to combine simple molecules of hydrogen to form helium, releasing energy in the process. Of course, this is different from the process of nuclear fission, which today's nuclear reactors use. I wouldn't like to say that the article I read as a boy was totally inaccurate. It's true that the concept of producing energy from nuclear fusion essentially reproducing the reactions by which our sun and other stars produce energy, depends on fusing atoms of hydrogen, but the time scale suggested was hopelessly wrong. To this day, despite some very embarrassing false claims from scientists who should have known better, we have not been able to produce energy from nuclear fusion in a controllable way. Let me make clear what I mean by this statement before some journalist in the audience gets hold of the wrong end of the stick. Yes, we have been able to fuse hydrogen atoms to produce helium and a release of energy, but the balance account has always been negative. We've always had to put more energy into the reaction than we've ever succeeded in getting out. We know the theory works but we still do not know if we can get fusion to work for us and solve the problem of our energy needs. Before going on to give you a summary of the innovative ways being tested to overcome them. First of all, we have to try to understand the incredible physical conditions that exist inside a natural nuclear fusion reactor such as the sun. To start with, we have to create temperatures never experienced on our planet. Indeed, if we had experienced the temperatures required, then our planet would never have formed. We have to generate temperatures of at least 100 million degrees Celsius in a carefully controlled environment before we can even hope to produce a fusion reaction. The problems are immense, but it can be done. Many of you will know that you can put your hand into a very hot oven and not get burnt, provided you do not touch any of the surfaces. I won't go into the reasons for this phenomenon here, but we are applying roughly the same principles in designs for fusion reactors. 
I think I can promise you that the heat will be confined to a very small area. The other major problem we have to find a solution to is pressure. The pressures in a massive body like the sun are vast, and this is what brings the hydrogen atoms into such close proximity to one another that they fuse into helium. We may not have to achieve the same pressures in a fusion reactor, but even so, it is a huge technological problem. What, then, makes me hopeful about the future of energy from nuclear fusion? Perhaps surprisingly, it is developments in laser technology. We can now use lasers to control the nuclear fuel pellets so that they remain suspended inside the reactor without touching the sides. Remember that these pellets are quite small, and because they contain atoms of deuterium and tritium, the two isotopic forms of hydrogen that can be used in these reactions, they are quite light. The lasers will also compress the fuel pellet to raise the pressure to that required to initiate the fusion reaction. Another, far more powerful laser will be used to heat the fuel pellet to the temperature required. This laser, if you like, will act as the trigger to start the reaction. Once started, it is hoped that the reaction will produce enough energy to maintain itself, and also that it will produce a surplus in the form of heat that can be used to produce the steam needed to drive turbines in order to generate the electricity the world needs. To give you some idea of how much energy we can produce, it has been calculated that just one kilogram of fusion fuel is capable of producing the same amount of energy as 10,000 tons of fossil fuel. I think you would agree that such an objective is worth working towards. I believe, and I am not alone in this, that nuclear fusion could supply the world's energy needs for centuries to come. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet. <laughs>